We weren't a team that had been together for more than 30 days. You realize when we all got there that the mission that we we're supposed to be there for, it was bigger than us. It was bigger than an individual. Train, 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 train your highest level. Push yourself in training. Get as much experience as you can because when the panic sits in or you can't have the opportunity to panic, your body will shut down and you will go to your highest level of training. My gut feeling at that point in time, that early on, is that they, they just panicked. And when you panic, they went into what we call the black. They, they shut down. They didn't know what to do. If 13 hours, if the movie would have came out sooner, it would have had a major impact on I'll his be honest, reelection. I, I think even if we would have just said something sooner, it would have. So many movies in the history of elections have impacted elections because they've taken shots at certain presidents. You can think about Black Hawk Down, which came out, the story of what happened in Somalia back in 1993 yeah. when uh, Bill Clinton was president. And then you have the documentary Fahrenheit 9-11 that came out that kind of took shots at Bush's yeah. administration and what they were doing with Michael Moore. And then you have the movie 13 Hours that came out by Michael Bay which the book became obviously very big. If you go on Amazon right now, I don't know if you've seen the stats on this book, it's 13 dim. Hours. It's 3,500 reviews on Amazon, all five star. And it's a pretty controversial story, but did a lot. So it premiered January 12, 2016 at the AT&T Stadium here in I Dallas, uh, Cowboy Stadium. Right. You said roughly 35,000 people between, showed up there. Uh, 35, 37. 35, um, 37,000. It, it, it was, and I know we're, we're splitting hairs there, but no, yeah. there, was a, there was a lot of people there. A lot of people there. I'm sitting with Chris Peranto, which Chris Peranto known as Tanto. Tanto, if you saw the movie, 13 Hours. Pablo, how do you say his last name? Pablo Schreiber. Pablo Schreiber. Schreiber. Be by far the best actor in the movie. John, you, you did good. Krasinski, but Pablo should have got top billing. I know I'm that a was a big Pablo fan. I, I, we were talking no, about Pablo's that. Awesome. Pablo no. is sick. He, and he, he's ja and he jacked. He's jacked. I mean, I yeah, am, he is jacked. I am too, he's but jacked. not like Pablo. Pablo is jacked. Pablo is jacked. He's a so, big dude. So first of all, thank you for your service, oh, no, brother. Thank and thanks for coming out here no, to Dallas. Course. Walk us through this whole thing. And obviously, you wrote another book called The, the Ranger Way. The Ranger That's a Way. leadership book. Certain yes, things is. that you can apply in personal life as well to succeed. I want to talk about that as well. But before doing that, first of all, the whole Benghazi situation that took place. I know this has been talked about many, many times but you know it's been past the time where sure. some of the stuff can be talked about walk us through what happened there's obviously a lot of stuff leading up to it yeah. we're on tv we're watching the news oh, yeah. oh this man <laughs> made this youtube video and he offended people on 9 11 2012 yeah. and this is why they attacked you the embassy you would have thought they could have thought of something better than that but that's we'll get into that as a team we've been there now we all for people that don't know the story we weren't military we all were veterans at the time we all were contract security contractors for the CIA at the time. And uh, we weren't a team that had been together for more than 30 days. People don't realize that. It wasn't like, oh, you come in as, a, you know, when you're a Ranger unit or you're a Marine squad or SEAL team, wow, you work days. together for, but you know, as, as contractors, you come in at every, individually, you coming in under a guise. And I don't wanna get into any more than that. We get into tradecraft. But you come in and the team just kind of melded. And now I'm not saying we all got along either. We don't. I'll tell this to people when I do my speaking events, me and Oz, we, we don't get along. Till today. We, till today. We tolerate each other. I mean, you realize when we all got there that the mission that we we're supposed to be there for, it was bigger than us. It was bigger than an individual. And in that line of work, you find a way to work together. We're going to get in the Ranger way. That's one of the facets there. Is it doesn't matter if y'all get along. You, you find a way to work together to succeed. And in that side of the thing, if you don't succeed, well, people die. You're at the highest levels of success or failure. We got there. We'd been there for about 30 days together. Now, individually, each of us had been there a certain amount of times. So myself and Boone, who's sitting over here, but he won't be on camera. He's still shy. He's um, got the sniper he, he's, on, he's, he's on covering everybody, me. Though. He's covering me. Him and I actually were supposed to go home earlier, and we extended. I don't think it was a, a coincidence that that team was supposed to be there that night. Him and I were actually supposed to go home, a, I think a couple weeks prior, we stayed longer, same with Roan. And were you guys friends prior or actually, no? Actually, him so and you, I were the only two that had worked together even before. he's a Marine and you're a we had uh, started. Army. We had started contracting at Blackwater <laughs> Security in 2003, 2004, and I, I carried him through all the contracting, of course. I had to drag him through, I'm kidding. <laughs> he's gonna shoot me. No, we, we met there at like Blackwater. He yeah. looks like a he, he can shoot, dangerous. He can shoot. He's, he can do, he's we, pretty We picked you up and then he's <laughs> sat back they didn't say a single no. word and i felt this red mark in the back of my head i was like some shit's back here i don't know it was heating up and now it's starting to make sense it makes why sense. it was it's that up. laser yeah. laser focus so it was no actually boone and i had been together for 10 years we'd contracted in together and worked in afghanistan iraq pakistan yemen and so forth and libya of course bottom line is is the night came about there was an attack on 9 11 2012 um, without getting into um, any more of the prior stuff, which there is more, and the book has more of it in there. The U.S. consulate was under siege, and we weren't U.S. State Department facility. We were CIA security officers. 
And there was an ambassador by the name of Chris Stevens there. And Chris Stevens, of course, high level ambassador, very high ranking individual. There were other security officers at his side and they were overrun. They were essentially overrun immediately. Very little security on this facility. Is that common by no, the way? How low? It, it was very odd. And that's part of the story. That's if people that know 13 hours or if you do start to learn about it. That's what was very odd about that particular event and why I think it started to make headlines and climb is because as people found out that, whoa, we got an ambassador that had worked his way up from the ground level on up. And that's when you, you obtain a certain, and it's not rank, but you, there's a level of ambassadorship that his, that when you get to a Chris Stevens level, that it's not donating to a foundation. And here you're given an ambassadorship is that you have worked your way up and now you are looked at highly. And if you want to put a rank to it, if you want to put an equivalency, mm -hmm. Ambassador Stevens is a three-star general. If that's seriously, and that's a high level guy. Three star. And the reason I can say that with, with some authority is because I worked for the State Department and I protected ambassadors before I went to the CIA. So I, I do know the different levels of ambassadorship. The bottom line is you leave this guy, he's a high value target. They get overrun. Long story short, they're trying to call, the State Department guys are trying to call us for assistance. We're the only game in town that they know of that can get to them. And we are told basically to wait, stand down, then wait again. And then we finally buck orders and we go over there. We disobey our CIA directives to stand down. And how, how much, did, how long did you stand 30 down? 30 minutes. There's different timelines. Mine is 30 minutes because that's I'm going by my watch. Yep. I'm not going by some DC report. I'm not going by what somebody saw on Facebook at the, in Langley on my watch. How far are you? We're three quarters of a mile. Oh, so you're hearing we're, everything. No, we're watching it, seeing it. And it's, uh, I tell everybody that's out there, see, it's, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. When you're watching firefights, it's, it's beautiful. When you're hearing things, you're seeing the tracers go up in the air. Tracers are the rounds that burn. Advantage for U.S. military and U.S. contractors and anybody that is a paramilitary or military personnel within uh, the United States is that the advantage of night vision that we have is incredible. They still use tracers. They still use bullets that burn so they can adjust fire. And it, it limits them, but it leads to a great light show as you're watching it from a, not afar, but sim really close. When you were watching it, did you know what it was, what was yeah, going like on? Yeah, you do become acclimated to the sound of gunfire as you spend time overseas. No, I get it. But did you know where it was? And yes. Like, like they were attacking us? We heard a little rat attack and we're yep. not thinking of anything. And then there's a call on the radio from our GRS, that's what we are, global response staff, from our team leader. And he says, we need GRS in the team room. And then when he said, with a little bit more vigor, we need GRS in the team room now, that's kind of when you're like, this isn't the normal AK-47 gunfire in the pier because their soccer team won sort of gunfire. Something's going on. And when you get out the door, as soon as we got out of our front door, as soon as you see the tracers bounce up there, because of the experience levels of the guys there, it, you know, you piece it together like, oh crap, that's the console. They're getting hit. And then you start hearing the radio chatter from the State Department, the security officers. We had same radio free frequencies they did and Alec Henderson, one of the State Department officers, one of the ambassadors, security personnel, he's calling us on the radio saying, GRS, we need you. GRS, we, we, we're taking fire. And obviously we know that we can see it. GRS, the constant's been overrun. Within the first five minutes, we knew from when we got called, we knew that that constant was getting just hardballed with RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, AK-47 fire, PKM fire, grenades. You're hearing all of oh, yeah. You're, you're seeing all of You're this. seeing it, you're hearing it. And your mindset as a team, you, and again, that's why I say we had a great team there. No Nobody panicked. Everybody was pretty salty. All of us in our 40s, all of us had multiple deployments. All of us, of course, had great training within our military branches. No, everybody just did their job. We all had responsibilities. And when I do the leadership talks, I, I tell the people this. I, you know, it's kind of like a, a lessons learned. Train, train, train. Train to your highest level. Push yourself in training. Uh, get as much experience as you can because when the panic sits in or you can't have the opportunity to panic, your body will shut down and you will go to your highest level of training. And again, we were very blessed because the team had so much experience and training training that everybody just went into what their job was to do and nobody barked orders, nobody yelled at anybody. Everybody had a responsibility. Our GRS guys, the CIA personnel, yeah, they're, they're panicking. They're, they're running everywhere. And you're seeing them. Oh yeah. Who called the shots and listen, we don't, we, we don't believe these guys. They're I, not telling us anything, let's just know, go. To me, there was essentially two stand downs. There was one by our CIA personnel, our CIA chief of base and our CIA chief of station in Tripoli. My gut feeling at that point in time, that early on is that they, they just panicked. And when you panic, they went into what we call the black. They they shut down. They didn't know what to do. And instead of making a decision, they made no decision. I remember that. And I, I've even testified to this. I don't think their initial don't go stand down was a political. I think they just didn't know what the hell they were doing. But the egos kicked in and people that didn't know what they were doing, they didn't say, hey, you know what? We don't know what the heck we're doing. You guys do. 
go ahead out. They just kept holding on to the ball, thinking that either it would work itself out or they just would maybe think of the right thing to do. How much of it was, you know, because you hear, oh, we can't get her up because she's sleeping and oh, no one's getting that, How much, was that propaganda or was that actually like uh, we couldn't you know, get a hold of them and nobody make a decision? <laughs> I think it was more propaganda. Okay. Of course it was. I honestly believe that if the story, the true story would have come out and we would have found out that, yeah, there wasn't a video, that there was no hubaloo about a protest because the election was going on. Actually, Obama was not he was him and Romney were pretty dang tight at that point in time. Part of his political platform was Al Qaeda was on the run. Al Qaeda was part of the attack that night in Libya. It was Al Qaeda in the Maghreb and Ansar Sharia. I don't think it, he would have won if it would have been if we, if the truth would have come out like that. I really do not think, and and the truth didn't. If 13 hours, if the movie would have came out sooner, it would have had a major impact on I'll his be honest, reelection. I, I think even if we would have just said something sooner, it would have. And, but nobody did. It, do, you, do you think 13 hours affected Hillary's campaign of her not winning? I, I do. I think a lot of people started to see the things that they already knew. There is a deep state. There is people, and the politicians change history to fit their own narratives. And, and the media, especially mainstream media, change history to fit their own narratives so they can keep pushing whatever agenda they want. People started to see that, and I do believe that. And I don't think I'm, I'm going on a limb saying that, not because of what happened there and, and what us coming out and speaking out in Benghazi, but because it helped other people start to stand up and say, you know what, this isn't right. You know what, this isn't right. Now we sacrificed our careers by telling the truth. We were, we were essentially fired. We lost our security clearances or they were suspended as a contract. All, six. all of us. As a contractor, you get a security clearance suspended, you're not working anymore. That's essentially you're getting fired. We we didn't just get our CIA security clearance suspended. We lost our State Department one, and I lost my D DOD one as well, my, my D Department of Defense one. So, of course, there were repercussions because of it. But you know what? We, we knew that was going to happen. I'm not crying about it. That's how the government works. It's like a lawyer lo losing their license. You can't yeah. practice it. You can't practice it. You, you can't so, practice it. So we can't, yeah. we can't deploy anymore. I do honestly believe, yeah, that, that it had a negative detriment on her political aspirations to become president, but it was well-deserved. Hey, she made the decision. And a stand down that the military heard, now that was a political stand down. That was about, it's hard to say on time, but said about midnight, because the military guys on the ground, whether it was 555th Fighter Wing in Aviano, mm -hmm. whether it was the Fast Company Marines in Sigonella, the tankers that were in Sigonella, the 10th Special Forces Group that had been repositioned and had been moving towards us, the Commander's Extremist Force, those things were all shut down at midnight. And we did find out later that that was a State Department call. and. Who was in charge of the State Department? Well, Hillary Clinton. Then you got Patrick Kennedy and Charlene Lamb, which were the undersecretaries that people don't know much about. And those two are just as directly responsible as well. But then you also have to put a lot of the responsibility and the onus on the commander in chief. He's in charge of the military. Why didn't you step in and do something? Political aspirations took precedence over guys on the ground's lives. So. My friend, I was telling you kind of a little bit about mm -hmm. him when I was at Fort Campbell, and he's the guy that went to Vicenza and yeah. the whole story. Yeah, and yeah. He went and became <clears throat> Special Forces. And one time he and I were talking, he was in somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in Europe or the Middle East. And I said, Who do you follow on the news. He says, Pat, I don't trust anybody. I said, tell me what you mean by, he says, Pat, no one is telling the truth. I said, honestly, but who is pretty close? And he gave me one name at that time. He says, you know, Bill is a little bit close at what he says. You know, we were oh, talking, talking about Bill O'Reilly. Bill, Bill he said Bill O'Reilly's yeah, yeah. a little bit close yeah. on some of the stuff that was happening in the war. But he says, I don't believe anybody else. I said, so what is your reaction when you watch? He says, you have no idea how frustrating it is to watch it to the point where we yeah. don't even want to watch it yeah. anymore. Is that kind of the feeling you had when you were yeah, watching? Yeah, I do. The feeling with Bill, well, I was on Bill's show once. Bill's an asshole, dude. <laughs> just, hey, he didn't let us say one word. He was the first time we were, I was on TV. He was my break into the media. But at that tone, point in time, too, we couldn't really say too much because it was right at the beginning. Dang, what an arrogant ass. At that point in time, too, yeah, he can be. Hey, he could be. 3.8 million exactly. followers. So I mean, he was number one on the uh, show. On the show. And, yeah. and he, he did say things that I thought were fairly accurate. Not everything, because every media outlet has an agenda. They do. My opinion at that point in time, and he, this is the reason why we did his show, and he it was Brett Barrett. I thought he was fantastic. Just, just being so he's humble. A stud. To me, he come, he's, a, he's a stud. And, his, they, and his hair never messed up. Dude, his hair, we were drinking after the show. His hair, he drank more than I did. His hair never messed up. It was mm -hmm. unbelievable. He drank. That's so a good for Oh, my more. gosh. Are you kidding Seriously. Me? I'm I mean, impressed. I mean, I'm going to watch him now I mean, from a standpoint of Budweiser. This message is sponsored this by is Budweiser. He, I should completely have a different and perspective. He's the, but he's the nicest. He just interviewed nicest Comey, guy. by the way, just recently. I don't know if you saw that. He interviewed Comey oh, like yeah, a week we, and a half. We don't, we, don't, we don't need to talk about that. I heard you were a diehard Comey fan. I oh, saw yeah, a sticker you had on your yeah, folder. I said, I said, I love Comey if he's six feet under. That's what it said. Is that, am I going to offend people there too? There's no love for for James Comey here either. Don't Let worry. me ask you, is there no love for James Comey or is there no love for the FBI, period? The FBI guys on the ground do their job. Okay. They're hard. And I will say this from any aspect, the guys on the ground do their job, even us. I mean, 
I deployed for 10 years. There were a lot of crooked things going on in the government that honestly I just chose either not to pay attention to or my job is here. Whatever's going on up there, if they want to be shady, then you let them be shady. My job's to watch my brother's back. And that's how the FBI is. The administrator, the head people up the top, especially at that point in time, terrible. Same thing, controlling terrible. politics, same exact. It is, it's megalomaniacs, brother. How should we differentiate between the regular guy that works, got a family, got kids, is watching yeah. CNN, Fox, MSNBC, where is a source for us to be able to tell the difference versus a guy like you that's on the, on the field seeing it happen? I said this when the Bergdahl case came out, you know, Bo Bergdahl. What were his troops saying? What were the guys that were with him? What did they say about him? And they all came back negative. That, that's who you're listening to. What were the media saying? Don't worry about the media saying. What are the guys that are around him saying? I guess you have to pick and choose. I'm not going to tell you, oh, listen to, listen to Brett Barrell. Even though I like him, I thought he was great with us. Listen to Sean Hannity or listen to Anderson Cooper. I'm not going to say that. I'm say, just watch. See who they're interviewing. Now, that's talking about troops on the ground, I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, it's hard when you get into the politics because now that you got both of them playing the, the cloak and dagger sort of thing where you got a supporter for Trump, then you got a supporter for Bernie Sanders. If there's stuff that goes on where you have guys in a unit that have been working with them like the FBI and they're saying one thing, I don't care what the media's saying. If they're all saying the same thing, those guys that, that worked or served with this gentleman, especially at the ground level, then you listen to that. But I don't watch the news either. I'll read a little bit every once in a while. You never know which way you're gonna get slanted, whether it's left or right. So it's fair to say you and Judy are now going on a campaign trail to help promote the book, uh, you know, <coughs> lo loyalty. A higher, lo okay, well, yeah, that, that was a perfect title for us, but a higher loyalty, yeah, a higher loyalty to himself. That's basically, Comey, a higher loyalty to himself and whoever else that asked us he was ki kissing before she didn't get elected. I don't know, did that, was that too obvious? <laughs> nah, no, no, okay, we're just, good. Go back and walk us through where you were at. So you're there, you're seeing it, you're, you're, you're saying mm -hmm. on your watch, it's at 30 minutes. My watch they're calling in, you guys are saying, let's just go. Ooh, ooh, all the other Marine units, they're kind of hanging tight. Well, because actually, after all, all, all these other military units, we didn't know they were getting spun up. We found out after the fact, uh, Trey Gowdy's committee actually did a good fact finding or, or intel, beast, intel by the way. yeah i wish he would have his job wasn't to find fault but he had enough information to find fault but he didn't he didn't pinpoint anything even though his report was fantastic what I, he did with hillary clinton on that one trial like the way he asked the oh, question it was good i think he he could have taken it farther where he could have said this is your fault but he didn't but do you know his, why do you have an opinion why his job not? was his job wasn't to do that his job was to collect information that was Whose it. job was to take it further? The FBI. And he didn't and do who, it. Well, who was that? Yeah, Comey. There you go. Got it. <laughs> and, but so he this did. all comes back to where you're at, and th this, is, this is why for you, feeling toward, co towards Comey is from... And at that point, it wasn't just something that came up where I decided right then and there, I'm going to... No, I've been letting this go, and I've just been paying attention and collecting information over the last, what now has been six years you were talking about math hey when the numbers add up then that's what the answer is going to be and if the numbers don't add up well then it's not but the numbers have added up that this is what has taken place and and that she was being protected but yeah I'll get back to what was going on that night we finally got a call from alec henderson saying grs if you don't get here we're all gonna f and die the movie's very accurate that's exactly what he said and we just took them ourselves and we, we left. We, we left without orders. The CIA, our base chief still stands, oh, I told them they could go, they could go. Same with our team leader, but no. We, in fact, I remember Boone and I were, were in our car trying to get our team leader in the car saying, get in, we need to go, get your, and I'm. You had the four. We had a GRS team leader and a, he was a staffer. Oh, that's right, got it, And yes. we had a chief of base. Yep. While we're trying to get out of there, he still wouldn't get in our car. And we were, you know, it, it was time to go. And we had to basically cuss his ass out to get him in the car. And I remember I said, get your fucking ass in the car. And then we shut out the gate. And because of that 30 minutes that we waited, Ansar Sharia and AQIM, Al-Qaeda, were able to basically get dug in in their positions. And we had to actually fight the next 400 meters. When we got close, it was about 400 meters away. We had to stop, park, and then we had to fight our way on foot which took us another th about 30 minutes to go that 400 meters, which we split up in teams. Me and Boone took two Libyan guys. I don't know how I could trust them. I just thought I could grab them. And then Ty and Jack and John went down another route and we split and fought our way on foot the rest of the way to get in there. And so by the time we actually got into the consulate from when the first call came to us, about an hour. And then we get in there and it's, people have seen fires. When all that's going on and you see that, it's, it is beautiful. 
I like I said, I've been asked, that's the most horrible experience. No, it's not at all. I was they define the beautiful, beautiful to you. What do you mean by beautiful? Just the colors. Oh, the uh, color. When stuff like that happens, you have the option to either, the adrenaline overtakes you, you get this tunnel vision where everything just kind of comes in like this. You do can things slow down for you or do things go faster for you? Uh, honestly, things go open. It's, think of a horse with little racing yeah, blood. Yeah. Things go like this. But that was from experience over time. That was from different situations. That's from being overseas so much. If that would have happened earlier in my career, yeah, it may have stayed like this. But because at that point in time, and I was happy to be there. So I was like, God, thank you for putting me here. Whatever happens, happens. But I'm going to have fun and fight my ass off while I'm here and make sure my brothers go home. And there's actually a psychological or physiological response. It's called the flow. And your world just goes, whoosh. people think, does it slow down? Does it speed up? No, it doesn't do any of that. It's just, you're just able to see everything. And the colors just pop. They're bright. Sounds just incredible. I just get smiling thinking about it. So I remember seeing that fire and seeing the, even the diesel smoke in the dark, it's just still black as night. It's just, it's, it's unbelievably awesome. You either are in your element or you're in the fetal position and it doesn't mean you know, any one of us are superheroes. It's just that that's our element. Children. Were all of you like that? All six of yeah, you? Yeah, I would honestly say all of us were like that because of the actions. Wow. Nobody took a pause. When we were moving, that was what was so impressive. It was like a symphony that night. Whenever a decision needed to be made, a guy made it and there was no argument and it was generally a decision that all of us agreed on like that. It wasn't need to be talked about. Like when Boone said, hey, I'm going this direction. I'm going to go pull security. Roger that. Uh, Rollins, I'm going in the building to check for the ambassador. Cool, got you. I'll be over here. I'm pulling security this way. And there was no argument. It just was, but that says a lot for the special operations community. And that says a lot for the Marine Corps. Even though we're at different branches of service, you get put through a lot of the similar training and you're able to work well together. It was amazing. All the guys, there was not one guy there that, that locked up, which I would say like mm -hmm. froze. Freeze. But again, like I said, from the beginning, I think there was a reason that team was supposed to be there. I've been on teams where guys have frozen, and this team didn't. So for the next hour or so, we're on the, in the compounds nine acres. For those that don't want to get in relative size, that's three football fields. That's the size of the U.S. consulate. There's six of us trying to clear this nine acre compound. Nobody wears uniforms. So you don't know who friend or foe is. You have no clue. You only know when they shoot at you. And uh, it's a pretty intense. I mean, you're, you're clearing. I, now I was tired. And I remember, in fact, I'm sitting here with me. I'll tell a story about Boone right now. He jumped over that back gate. I remember. And I said, when you go to this back gate, please open it so I don't have to jump over. Cause I'm, I, hey, I'm carrying a little bit more weight than he is. I'm carrying a machine gun. <laughs> I was tired. We've been jumping over walls. And at this point, what time is it? Maybe about 11 o'clock. Got it. He jumps over the back gate. And I remember all I seen was take off, running. And I'm like, good, open this case, we'll have to open it. Cause I had to climb it mm -hmm. too, it was unsafe. So he's clearing it and all I could think of was, get your head back ass over here so I don't have to climb it. But I had to climb it anyway. So we get on that gate and it's just funny things that you remember that happened. We get in there, I climb over the top and I remember I, I pulled a blocking position. I, I laid, cause I had my machine gun, I laid down the prone and got behind it. And Tig didn't think I was in the right spot. So he said, ah, oh, can you point your gun that way? I'm like, hey, motherfucker, I'm fucking tired. No, I'm not doing that. And then I moved over a little bit and then I remember he started moving and he says, Tony, we got to clear this. And we just started clearing the compound ourselves. And we had to clear two buildings that we still hadn't cleared to found survivors because we didn't, have, didn't know who was alive. All it is is essentially moving through a compound, moving through, they had a vineyard there. You know, they had buildings that are burned. I mean, there's fire everywhere. They had two vehicles that were on fire. It's chaos, but it's, it's what I call, I like enjoyable chaos. And the rest of us wanted to be there. And what you're doing is you're just, Okay, what do we need to do? Now let's move forward. We know how to move forward. Guns up. Okay, there's a building. Let's clear this building. Clear the rooms. Do your CQB that you've been trained. Find the survivors. Okay, now what do we need to do? Okay, keep looking over your shoulder. Make sure there's nobody pointing a gun at you. Are you looking? You checking my six? Are you guys getting shot this entire time? At <laughs> that point in time, we didn't. Uh, actually, TIG and why we were able to get on that mm -hmm. onto the consulate is because TIG, we had a 40 millimeter grenade launcher and TIG was hammering them with this 40 millimeter grenade launcher. And, and that thing will tend to disperse your bad guys. It, it will get them off there, at least initially, but they're going to come back, which they did. And about 1130, we'd found there were five survivors and we we're getting State Department guys collected to get off the objective to get off a consulate and I remember we were pulling security I remember Boone he came up to me and he said we lost one if anybody's ever met him before he doesn't get angry very often at all and I remember it, it kind of worried me because he was angry I mean he gets angry but not motherfucking that son of a and that's what he was I'm like what's going on he goes if he's and I remember I do remember him distinctly saying if he just would have let us leave on time and then I knew exactly what he was talking about he was talking about Bob keeping us there, telling us to stand down. And when he said that, my heart was like, we lost somebody, somebody just died. He didn't even need to tell me. I said, what do you mean? And I go, what happened? He goes, we lost somebody. And so I thought it was Tyrone or Tig or Jack. And I go, what do you mean? And he said, the IT guy. And at first I didn't remember who it was. 
because he hadn't been there for that long, Sean Smith. And I remembered it was Sean, and I'm like, oh, man. You go through these scenarios, you, you deploy for so many years. You know, I've never been shot, but shot at, never been shot. Sean had been in Libya for, what, two days, and he's dead. Oh, you know, and that's just, that's just, but that's war. You know, I remember looking, and I said, Sergeant, I go, what's going, and he locked it back on. You know, he locks back on, we're back on mission. And I remember running back in front of the compound, and I saw Jack Silva with Dave Ubin over Sean's body, and Sean was dead of smoke inhalation. And, you know, you're watching, but you have to fight through it. We don't know when help's coming. We still got to find the ambassador. We're on this nine-acre compound. It's a freaking block party now. There's Libyans everywhere. You How don't many know. people? How many people there, give or take? When we first got on the compound, we'd push the majority of them off. I think I maybe saw five or six, and when that happened, I think there's probably 20, and I could my numbers could be low. I, the 20, 30, they were just everywhere. I remember just seeing all, seeing Sean's dead body. I remember seeing Scott Wickland rocking. Scott was with the ambassador that night. He lost control of him. I can't condemn him for that. I mean, he he, he doesn't know if he's going to live. He's watching himself get cooked alive in that safe room. I do remember me going and pulling security and then a big explosion going off. I'm, I'm going, I went to the corner of the villa and somebody starts shooting at us. First, uh, an RPG hit, blew up. Didn't know it was an RPG because I didn't hear the first explosion and I had just got reacclimated to my position and there was a Libyan that ran by me and he has no hand as he wanders by me. Like, so my gun comes up, I see him, he goes in front of me, he's holding his arm and where his hand should be, it should not, it's not there. And it's funny, it actually is quite funny, not because of that and then you're saying, oh, he's just an asshole. That. What was funny is his buddy ran behind him after him. So this guy runs by. Mm -hmm. Let's think of a carnival game. Guys are coming by you, you know, you shoot the car, the things go. My gun comes up, he runs by, I go, what happened? Guys run by, he's got no hand, his buddy's behind him, he has a piece of his hand, and he's chasing him with. <laughs> so, my, this is what you're trying to figure it out. I'm like, dude, hey, he's got your hand, go back and get your hand, dude. That's what I want to say. And, I, and I'm laughing. And I, all I can get out though is I go, what happened? I don't know if even the guy speaks English and the guy goes grenade. So when he says that, I remember I relaxed. I put my gun down a little bit because I thought the dude tried to throw a grenade at us. Basically, you know, cooking a grenade off. I thought he pulled the pin, held Got it for it. three seconds. He held it for too long. When you cook a grenade off, you do it so your enemy can't throw it back. Well, I thought he pulled the pin and he, instead of counting to Time two, he counted to three and he, as he threw it, it blew up because he was throwing it at us. So I'm like, well, Serge, you're right. Don't throw grenades at us anymore. So I'm thinking in my head. Then you, we start getting shot at. Getting shot at when high velocity rounds are pretty close, there's not really a whiz. When they get close to your head, they break the sound barrier. So it's a snap. And it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. The whip, it sounds like, think of somebody cracking a whip. When somebody, that's what it sounds like. It snaps, 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 snaps. And that's when you know we're getting shot at. And Boone still gives me shit about it. He goes, that was a terrible tactic. I'm like, I know. I wasn't thinking tactics. All I was thinking of, I thought about Ranger history. I thought about when the Rangers jumped into Rio Hato and Panama. They landed on an airfield, no cover. What they, how'd they get off it? They didn't go run and try to find cover. They just started shooting back. I did eventually find cover behind a Land Cruiser. He did as well. He took the back fender. I took the front fender but we didn't realize we had taken cover behind the State Department guy's vehicle and they didn't want her to leave. They wanted to leave. We wanted them to stay because we needed their level seven armored vehicle to cover <clears throat> us. Nah, they left. <laughs> and Scott was driving. He kept honking at me to get, to get away from his vehicle because I was shooting over the hood. And Boone's on the back fender. He just kept going like this, honking at me. You know, so there's mass chaos already, people shooting. He's honking a horn at me. And I'm just like, can you give me a few seconds, dude? We're getting shot at. And he won't have it. So I just say, I remember I step back and I go, come on. Well, I didn't tell Boone they were moving. So they start moving and I'm seeing him sidestep a little bit. He's wondering, where the hell is our cover going? And they left us and they, but, and then they went left and then they went left again. And the movie's accurate. They, they got hammered. What we see in the movies that is pretty they, uh, they actually, Ansar Sharia has a safe house right next to the consulate. So the group that attacked the consulate was their neighbors, State Department. And I'm not even going to go any more than that. We, were, we kind of beat that dead horse. But State Department wasn't very good at deciding where they should put their consulate. Or they basically took it over right next to the terrorists. The terrorists did try to coax them in to get in there uh, like they did, the movies. And at least Dave Ubin and Scott and Alec had the wherewithal to not fall for it. And they punched it, but they got hammered and Still, chased all the yep. way back too. But we were under attack. And I remember I took a knee out in the open, and that's when Boone gives me shit about it. He goes, man, that's a terrible attack. I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to shoot. I just want to keep shooting. But he's right, but I want, there was no cover I could find anywhere. A little Libyan took a knee next to me. He started shooting with me, and then Boone, he saw I, I actually had switched to my M4 at that point in time, too, and he saw I was running out of ammo. And that's the beauty of working with somebody he'd worked with forever. I don't need to say a word. He already has a magazine in his hand, and I'm going to slid across the road. I reinserted. He's shooting next to me, and there's three guns, and we're just making sure nobody can get through this back gate. Are you guys all communicating the entire 
entire time? Yeah, we were communicating sort of not really so much voice commands at that point in time. And you get you get along enough far enough down the lines. It's just really visual. Or you're seeing what does he do? Okay, I know what I, mean, I need to do. Nice, you're talking about a compound. It's yeah, a it's a big, it's field, a big so. compound. So you're hearing some contacts on the radio, but when the bulls start flying, there's no there's no time to talk on the radio. I'm watching him. He's watching me. I see Tig. Tig gets actually up on that villa, the the ambassador's villa that's on fire, and he just starts shooting off that villa. I mean, that's pretty ballsy right there. Long story short, we end up fighting them off and we have to make a decision because we do have a, you know, we talked about DC seeing what was going on the rest of the country. Was, yeah, they were seeing what was going on at that point in time because we had a drone. A drone was overhead at that point in time, watching it in real time, everything that was going on. We had a drone? US had a drone from Derna that was over top of us at that point in time, watching us at 11.30 Benghazi time, 11.30, 11.45, seeing what was going on in every place in the United States that had a drone feed from DOD, AFRICOM, which would have been seventh floor of, of the CIA, seventh floor of the State Department, which is the high level floors, that's your directors. And you're also your uh, Secretary of State, the Pentagon, White House, and then every military facility that has that capability, which command structure, they're seeing that we're in a firefight. At that point in time, we're under siege. So for when they first came out and said, oh, we weren't sure what was going on, no, that was bullshit. They knew. Because they were watching it. And that drone was giving us information. That was a drone that told us, hey, we're seeing what's going on, guys. They're going to attack the annex. you got to get back from the annex. Who's leader. telling you this? Uh, we're actually getting word from our chief and our team leader, which is getting word from the command structure there uh, in, Tri in Tripoli, which is getting word from either AFRICOM or they're getting word from the 7th floor in Langley. So everybody's seeing everything that's going on and all the radio communication is being heard on all everybody's radios that has a SATCOM radio. Everybody that's fitted into that channel, which is every CIA base in the world, is hearing everything that's going on. Every CIA base in the world is hearing that what's ha going That on has a particular SATCOM radio that's with, tuned to that channel. Again, I can't get any more than that, but that's what it's what, there for. What time is it over here? It's 11.30 our time, night time, so it's the, after, it's the afternoon. It's not, not like everybody's sleeping. No, it's 11.30 p.m. And what Benghazi day is this? This is, this is not, we're still in 9-11-2012. It hasn't even got to no, 9 I know it's 9 11 2012 but what day is it? Is it, uh, what, uh, You know what, that's a good question. You have to look that up. I don't remember. I honestly say I can't remember. I, we'd have to Google it. Seven hours. Well, seven hours seven difference, hours. got so, it. So it's, it's uh, seven hours and we're actually ahead. So it's seven, U.S. is behind. So that's right, right. So it's afternoon. Yeah, it was afternoon. I mean, it was day. No, everybody was up. It's dinner time. It's, it's, it's happy hour. No, everybody's seen it. And the drone says, you guys got to get back to the annex. And I do this as a lessons learned too when I do the leadership talks as well. As a leader, sometimes you do have to make a decision and it's a decision that may haunt you forever. And it does. We, we made, the team made a decision and we made a decision to get back to the annex, even though we hadn't found the ambassador. Every branch of service has a, you know, never leave a fallen comrade. Ranger Creed, part of the fifth stanza is you never leave a fallen comrade to fall in the hands of the enemy. But we did. We left the ambassador. We left him there. We didn't know it. We tried to find him. And I'm telling you, I remember taking my turn to run in that villa that was on fire. It felt like hitting a pizza oven, hitting that door and all that heat and fire. And it's unbelievable how bad it is. But bottom line is, is that when we went back to our annex to protect it, because the ISR, the drone was telling us to get back to it, to defend it, because there were people starting to mass nearby to go attack the CIA annex, we made the decision to leave. And the ambassador was found in his safe room one in the morning or so when the fighting moved from the consulate to the CIA annex. He was found in there when the, the fire died down by locals. I believe he was already dead from what I understand. And I, I do believe that. He had, was already dead of smoke inhalation. There's no way he could have survived all that. I mean, just by me running in there when I could and trying to get back to where he was at, there's just no way. You hear some vicious things, what they did to him, by the way, which is I, very I ugly things, and then you have to do yeah, a fact check to see if it's real, if it's not. I don't not. believe that. And I've seen that before, too, when I was in Iraq. You know, they can do some pretty mean, and they did mean stuff to, when they caught Gaddafi, same thing. Yeah. Unless you do a full-on autopsy, we'll say, it, of his anal cavity, yeah. you'll never know. Yeah. I did inspect his body the next day when they brought him to us to get him on the plane, when uh, the militia that had him at the at the hospital brought. I did not see desecration. I didn't see, you know, like he was dry, like Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. I didn't see scrapes. <laughs> I didn't see anything like you that. You didn't see it. But also, he also had his, you know, he also had his, his clothes on, so, and I didn't take him off to see. But as far as face, neck, and the little piece of his hands, that I didn't see, I didn't see like, you know, if, if somebody's been drug everywhere, you're gonna see it. I mean, mm. you're gonna see the scrapes, you're gonna see the blocks of hair out, you're gonna, and I didn't see that. But as far as the sodomization yeah, that may the have sodomization. Taken, I, I, that, I no don't know. No one would know. I yeah. don't know. It's amazing that you say what you're saying, and to you, 
we watch it and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, this guy really, that, that can't be real. Did you really go through that? And to you, that's your job to do that. Michael Bay did a phenomenal job. I did. Not making it a political message. Well, and not putting, so, not putting the Transformers and all that CGI in it. But <laughs> so we, we told him, like, oh, when he got picked, I was like, oh, Michael you're going to see some. He did it was awesome. an amazing job. Yeah. From the beginning to the end, it was what, 133 minute video? It's not it, a movie, it's it not was, like a it short was, No, it was yeah. two hours and like two hours and 13 minutes yeah, or something. Yeah, it was a long movie mm -hmm. and you're sitting there, you're watching. It's but like, it, oh, go, it really goes it by. It went by quick. so quick. You yeah. pop, all of a sudden you're done with it. You're wondering what happened with it. So when this thing came out and you're watching it, prior to that, what happened with you? You were asked to go to trial and you decided not to show up. Did that create a lot of a... Uh, did oh, that... When we were first asked to, uh, to testify, I said, no, I'm not, we're not, I'm not going to. Um, or, and it would have been closed door to, for Mike Rogers' House Intel, House Intel uh, subcommittee. I didn't. I was like, no, I'm going back to work. And the thing is, is it wasn't ever pushed. I guess the CIA figured as long as I was deploying, then I'm, you know, I'm controllable. He's, he's not going to say anything. He's still deploying. So and was, you were at the and time. I was. It was ne so it was never pushed. When we, as a team, decided to finally tell the truth and write the book, and the reason we did the book, it wasn't monetary. It, wasn't, it was what medium can we get it out where it's not slanted? Now we just talked about the the news. You know, mm -hmm. you don't watch the news because yeah. you don't know if you're getting the truth. We did think, you know, what do we do? Fox? What do we do CNN? No, you know, how can we do this where it stays apolitical and we're just telling you what happened in the book? By the many years that we had contracted, we'd made contacts with people. We knew people that had written books about influential figures, you know, working at Blackwater, you know, I, I knew the author that had written the book about Eric Prince. So we had opportunities to do that, but we also saw what had happened to the gentleman that wrote New Easy Day. In that book, there's, there's nothing, the killing of Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. there's nothing classified in that book, but he didn't. He got heat for but it. But he though. got heat because he, he didn't, he didn't go it. through the proper channels. Okay, so, so what is to, the proper channel? The proper get, ch first channel is to hire a clearance lawyer to make sure a security clearance lawyer that specializes in dealing with books to work where you have a security clearance. Got it. So that's why Comey said my book had to be cleared before yeah. I can publish it. You, so that is the process. That, that is the process and that's what we did. We, we hired a clearance lawyer by the name of Mark Zeta and we just started doing it the correct way. So what does he do? Does he tell you you guys can't disclose this? Is, this, this, is this, what he, yeah, this is what he, he does. And then he also Got goes it. to the agency and says this is what they're going to say. This is what we're going to do. What is classified? What is not? And it's not do you want them to say it? It's is this classified or not? That's it. Because I mean, there was a lot of things in the book they didn't want us to say, but it wasn't classified. In fact, the majority, if you read our book, there's nothing classified there. Who makes in the book. decision on what is classified, what they, is not they, classified? Uh, the agency has a clearance board, and a lot of them aren't even from CIA. They're, they're out, they hire them from outside. They're civvies? They're civvies? They're, they're, they're like, it's like a contract. In fact, this clearance board that we dealt with, they were a contracting company hired by the CIA. They weren't even CIA personnel, so which shocked me. I didn't even know that for the first, uh, till the book was almost done. Um, and that's because Mark told me the Zaid. And, uh, but yeah, he's the one that does all the, and in the meantime, we just, we continue to put our thoughts down, continue to do what we need to do to get the book. So when we say, go, you guys can write it, then we're, we're off and running. As far as being able to say anything at that point in time, we have to get the okay from Mark. And Mark was giving us the okay, our, our clearance lawyer, this is what you can do. How much was taken out? What percentage was taken out? Actually, there was nothing, there's nothing classified, classified in the book. The only thing that we couldn't do when the book first came out was we couldn't put our true names. So when you see the title where it says written by 13 hours, of the uh, what really happened in Benghazi written by Mitchell Zukov mm -hmm. and the Annex security team. That's what I see. Yeah. We had to put the Annex security team so because we hadn't got our names cleared yet. Got it. And when we finally got that okay, the argument was there was, wait a second, you guys gave Tyrone and Glenn's name out first thing. First day when they passed, you said, these are the CIA. You didn't even say Tyrone and Glenn, State Department. You said CIA security died in a, the next day. So like, and now you're telling us you can't, we can't use our names. And then Boone and I didn't go to the award ceremony. I didn't go to the, the joke CIA award ceremony. It was ridiculous. But Oz and Tig and Jack all went. When they left that award ceremony, the CIA gave them bags that said CIA on them with their true names on the bags to leave Langley. So like, guys, don't even. They, they didn't want us to choose our true names because it would have made it. it. They could have disputed the book or discredited it even more. So they tried to get us to change our names and not use our real names in the book itself. And in said, the book, your in name. The book. And that was, one of, that was one of the things that held it up for a little while longer and we fought it. Like, no.
and this let, is why. Let me ask you, what's the 30-year rule? Is there a 30-year rule? Uh, you know, you, I, you I, know which one I'm talking yeah, about, right? Yeah, you know, as far as where there's a statute of limitations, yeah. once for 30 years, you can say all you want. The government can do whatever the hell they want. If they want to come after you in 30 years, they can come after you 30 years. If you write a book and, and you don't get it cleared, if anybody hasn't found out from all this craziness that's gone on, all the, all the deep state stuff, and there yeah. is, there is, I do believe that, all the government can get away with murder literally and not get tried for it. The government can do whatever they want. If you have 30 years and, and then you write something and they want to come after you, they're going to come after you regardless. So you have to protect yourself. And they, and they can still come after us. They can come after any of us and hammer us. At How day. much did life change for you after the movie, <laughs> after, the, after the book came out than after the movie came out? Well, after the book came out, you see, what am I doing now? Nobody knew who the hell I was. I live in Nebraska, for God's sake. If that tells you how much I want people to know. Very good at volleyball, which is the jumping They are stuff. very good. That's and that the, jump, the jumping guys jumping um, my two ex wives volleyball players i'm just saying you guys you guys that date volleyball players you know what i'm getting at awesome awesome Listen, awesome, we awesome, had, awesome we had athletes. a 20 minute drive in the car that if that would have been recorded it would have it, it been all oh, man those, so oh. nebraska i've been to nebraska yeah, have yeah. you been through nebraska you saw cornfields you saw the nebraska volleyball team that is outstanding, outstanding but they spikes. are but they are well yeah. i mean they're the best in the country they're yeah outstanding when the book came out it's just like anything else. It's like a new toy. This is new to me. Okay, you know, how do I, how do I rationalize this to do it? It's new. Okay, I get to be in the spotlight. People are starting to know who I am. Isn't this what everybody wants? That's why we have social media. You, it's how many freaking followers you have. It's who, who's following you now? Who's liking your pictures? In that first year, you're getting into that. Like, wow, this is people recognizing me. But you're still trying to stay within yourself because wait a second, I didn't do this to be recognized. We're doing it to get the story out. And I don't really to honor Tyrone, Tyrone and, and Glenn who gave everything. They, they died that night, so we all, and they were our two medics, if that tells you anything about their character. They're not only shooters, they're also lifesavers. We lost our two medics right there off the bat. And I remember Roan, right before he died, he I'd cut my arm up pretty good. Uh, we went over a wall, we were jumping over right at the beginning, and one of the walls fell on, I, it fell down, and I just hammered my arm, and he had just come up and wrapped, you know, rinsed it out with saline and wrapped my arm before he died. So that was one of the last thoughts I remember. Ron is, he's coming and taking care of me. He's running from every, every building, taking care of everybody, and also fighting. But you're private, but you enjoy that. You try to make lemonade out of lemons. The daddy's home premiere. That's, that was fun. Got to go hang out. Got to go see Paramount. Got to see the studios. Writing the book. The book's out. Uh, Got to do all those book signings. You know, you're, you're meeting people and they're thanking you for their serve. They're, you're, you're seeing the positive side of people. You're also starting to see a little bit of the negative, the real big negative side of being called liars, being called you're doing this for money. Even who, even who was calling you that? Us, actually, the House Intel Select Committee, uh, Mike Rogers, actually, that was one of the, one of his questions to us was, uh, yeah, it was word is just doing this to, to make money with your book. Because, oh, it's like, that's kind of in poor taste. And it was, it, I'm saying it in context, it was a little bit more eloquent because it was That's a typically what they say when that yeah. comes out. It's like the first thing yeah. that comes out, yeah. and you're and just doing it to make money. Make, you know, I, was newly, I, know, I was newly divorced at the time. So yeah, come on, I'm, 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 having, a, I'm having a good time. I'm, I'm enjoying it. But just like any, it's like a toy, it's not my life. So it starts to get empty. Then the movie, you know, then we start pitching the movie. So it's in something else new. Now I'm getting to, okay, this is cool. I when are you pitching? It. What year are you pitching? When the movie come out? 16, January 12th, so 2015. 2015, we're starting to pitch the movie. How long did it take to make the movie? Actually, Michael did it. He, he filmed it in, in three months. Wow. Nine months total, I want to say, from when the pitch came out. Script writer Chuck Hogan, for those that don't know who Chuck Hogan is, we had an all-star team for our movie people. That's how I got made. I mean, Three Arts Entertainment with Erwin, Erwin Stoff. I mean, come on, Erwin Stoff started as Keanu Reeves' agent. He's blindsided, um, broken. So we got him him in our corner, Richard Abate, who's a, who's a huge book agent. He's in our corner. He's part of Three Arts as well. Then you get Chuck Hogan, who wrote The Strain, who wrote The Prince of Thieves, which is was made into The Town, which won an Oscar. You know, he's, he's mm -hmm. our script writer. And then you come in and you got Michael Bay and Bay Studios behind it. Did they all say, we want to be part of this? Yeah. It was like, did. I want to be Part of no, it. that that was it. We didn't go ask anybody. Did you pitch Michael Bay? Who did you pitch? We pitched the studios. We never pushed this. Let's make a movie out of this. We let everything come to us. We didn't, and if it didn't, it didn't. It wasn't. Oh, we're going to make this into a movie. People approached us. It wasn't us trying to reach out to a two agents. Yeah. And I think that's why it did so well, is because it wasn't us trying to find somebody that reluctantly. Oh, I'll do it. It was. Hey, we want to do this. And when you got Michael Bay saying, I want to do this, we met with Michael, had dinner with him, and you know what he got me? First of all, he loves veterans. Huge military supporter for people that don't know that. I saw that. Oh, that was impressive. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but my thing was, I go, you know this is going to be you're going to be hammered from the left. And I said, you know, Hillary might come after you. And he, you know, he said, and, and he may not even remember, he said, but I remember him saying this. He goes, fuck Hillary, I don't care. 
he's Michael Bay. Yeah, he, I, and it wasn't like, I'm Michael Bay, who's going to come? But that's how I took it. It was, I'm Michael Bay, who's going to mess with? And he's right. Who, and he doesn't give a shit. You see what movies he makes. He makes what he wants to make. By the way, I don't think it was politically left no. for him. No. Because he's very quiet about his political he, beliefs. He, he's just like, look, I want to make movies. I want to make movies. Yeah. And, and he kept it He kept it to the story. He didn't make it political. The movie isn't political. It shows, uh, it shows what happened to us. Whether it didn't help a political candidate, well, so be it. That's the political I candidate's fault. I don't even fault. think one time Hillary no. or Obama was no, mentioned in the we movie. We didn't put them in there. And they weren't going to be because... That was very uh, s smart to do that oh. because if you would have, then it would have been like, look, they're really reaching. Reaching, you know? yeah. yeah. And, and, but it still was still deemed as a right-wing movie. And there's a lot of theaters that didn't play that movie. I think it could have done a lot better. It did do well. It didn't get maximum exposure. Even though we did at AT&T Stadium, you know, a lot of theaters, especially in- I think you do box, box office was what, 65 million? Yeah. You cost 50 million, made 65 it, million, and that doesn't count. That didn't count. DVD, yeah, not DVD, but they, all they, the other they, stuff. They did all right. Of course, and, that, that and, movie's gonna do all right for a while. And it's, I told Michael, this thing's a marathon. This thing's not a sprint. Even if it gets cult status, but it's gonna give you every 9-11, this thing's gonna go. Black Hawk Down became a cult status. Yeah, and, and that's a great movie. I was very blessed from my father. My father was a very, he was a football coach. We talked about that. He, um, he coached at Brigham Young. And that was when they were national champions, when they had the Steve Youngs and the Jim McMahons and the Robbie Bosco. You don't make coaches like Lavelle Edwards anymore. You don't have Urban Meyer. All that. They don't make classy guys like that anymore. And for me to grow up in that environment, very charismatic. And my dad is very charismatic, very good speaker, very well in front of the TV. And I would just, I watched him. And also, when you don't give two shits what people think about you, it's very easy to get in front of a camera. Because no. you don't care what people yeah, think. Yeah. And my dad, having and seeing him, how professional he was on camera as a coach or talking in front of a group to leading men because he was a head football coach as well, and then not giving a crap what you what people think of you, it's very easy to Was get he through. always like that? Now, my dad is professional. My, my dad right now, he said, what did you just say, son, on TV? He's from Lubbock, Texas. Very disciplined, but he's very also a very, very good father, understanding. you got a good relationship. You know, very, oh, no, I love my dad. My dad's my hero. Yeah. If people ask me who's my hero, it's my dad. No, it's nobody else. My dad's my hero. Let me, what do they think about the whole thing that took place? Like, They're very proud that I spoke up, especially when, when, uh, when the and we're getting political again, but I'll, I'll, I'll use that as an example because my mom was very adamant about it. Uh, I remember when Hillary was saying, you know, women don't vote for Trump and all that. And my mom was like, and women don't vote for other women that leave their sons to die in foreign countries. So my mom is extremely supportive of, of what we did and speaking out. My dad's proud of me speaking out. He, he does wish I, wish I clean up my language a little bit more. They're very extremely supportive of, of me. They also are understanding that I wasn't raised to do what I'm doing now. But they're very proud that we taught our son that it, when when things change, that path change, we can, he can adjust to it and continue to excel. Do I enjoy it? No. Did I enjoy it in the beginning? It was new. Yeah, I, I learned from it. Do I enjoy it now? Being public figure, whatever the hell you want to call it? No, I, I don't. If you're going to do anything, and that's why you become a Ranger, a Marine, or SEAL, you're going to do, do it at 110%. You're going to do it the best at your ability. And that was started from my father, and then it was just hammered into me and multiplied times a million becoming a Ranger. If, you're, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to be good at it. I'm going to be the best at it. So let's transition into that book with the Ranger Way. So, yeah. so I, I was looking at the, the book and the reviews. I mean, it's remarkable reviews you got with uh, how people are talking about it. And it's great when I was just telling you about Jocko Willink. I yeah, was with him yeah. in San Diego. Jocko, I was telling yeah. how the Navy SEAL and I was sitting with him and he came out with the book Extreme Ownership and we're reading it. Our entire company read it. And you're sitting there saying these principles apply to business. Talk about one, what inspired you to write the book and what are some of the principles in that book that we you, can learn you from? You know, I, what I wanted to do, I didn't want to do a Jocko, a great book. And you, you see a lot of those military books. How, you, how do you apply Ranger School to everyday life? How do you apply uh, SEAL trained every day. I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to say, hey, guys, I'm like everybody else. I fail just like everybody else. So it's more of failing even when I was a kid. What did I fail at? What did I fail here? How did I got kicked out? People don't realize, I got kicked out of the army first time I was in. First time I was in, I got booted out of the army. And what did I do? I went to grad school. I took my GRE and I went to grad school because I had to take two years off. I couldn't reapply for the military. How old are you at this time? Uh, I was 27 at the time. I went to grad school, got my master's degree. I re-enlisted back in. And because my, 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 my dad, yeah, my dad's voice is saying, if you start something, son, you finish it. And I re-enlisted back in. So there is some military stuff in there. There's some places from some, some examples of other places I've been to as far as Iraq and Afghanistan. But the book is about how to succeed. You have to fail and you have to learn how to fail and you have to be able to pick yourself up and get back on that horse and continue on. And it's, it has actually stuff about not just military, but just 
failures in my life that everybody goes through. I said, we aren't superhuman. We're not any different than anybody else. We fail just like everybody else. The only difference is we learn how to pick ourselves up and to continue to keep moving. That's it all that is take one step back, go two steps mm -hmm. forward. That's, that's what we do. And that's what the Ranger way is about. It's about learning how to fail, which today's youth actually needs that. Today's youth doesn't, we, we talk, common core, they, they don't know no, how to fail. Listen, you for me, hear. the best thing that happened to me is joining the military. I was a 1.8 GPA kid. I went in, I came back, and I think a lot of undecided 18 year old boys today they need the army for a couple of years yeah. just to kind of whatever branch it is to go through. I don't think most people know what is ranger school. Like what is the timeline of, so talk about like, cause I know what it is, yeah. but this is not like a, a I'm airborne school. You see guys that have an airborne badge. I was air assault. Ranger is like one of the top four most difficult things to go through in Navy SEAL, Ranger, Special Forces. Why don't you talk a little well, bit about the and, Ranger and program? And first, so, so being Ranger qualified, having the Ranger tab, going to Ranger school, doesn't mean you're a Ranger. You're Ranger qualified. It was it was something you earned going through what we had. We called it Ranger Indoc, Ranger Indoctrination Program, which is three weeks of basically just hell. It was just a, a, a nut check. Could you do it? Then you get to your battalion. Then you have to prove yourself again and you have to be a private at your and being an untabbed private at the 75th ranger regiment at least when i was in i'm sure it's the same now it's awful you're getting and i'm not gonna lie hey nancy pelosi all them we got hazed every day hazed we got it was it was awful they have to see if you want to be there because if you can't take that in peacetime you can't take that when you're back in the states how are you going to take it when you start getting shot at and that was the best thing that could happen to me. Just got, you get your level knocked down, but you have to prove yourself physically and with your weapon systems and mentally and emotionally. And then you can go to ranger school. Then after all that, then you get to go to ranger school. And ranger school is, if you count RAP, uh, RAP, RASP, ranger assessment, which is, uh, which is where you go through to get your pre-training for ranger school. Basically, it's pre-ranger is what it is. Pre-ranger, you go to pre-ranger for three weeks. They're teaching you the small unit tactics. They're teaching you the tactics. You get to eat a little bit, but you're not getting any sleep. So that's three weeks. Then you go through zero week, which is basically your pre-week waiting for all the infantry officers to get there. So you, basically, it's just another week of hell at ranger school. And then IOBC guys, infantry officers come in, and all the officers come in, and you start actually doing ranger school. That's two and a half months. If you go straight through, you may recycle. Give me some of the crazy things you guys were doing. Well, you're not sleeping. If I got four hours of sleep in one night, that was good. I, I do remember specifically. Uh, if you got four, if, that was if, good. If you got four, I do remember specifically one time we were walking and we were at we were at Benning Phase, and I remember and we saw the old Nas, the old the old the old, the old the Cycloptic Seven Deltas, the old single, and they're heavy. I remember we're walking and and, we're, and it's starting to rain. It's just like, can this get any worse? It's already, we already messed up our op. We already didn't get our goes. I was one of the team leaders. I didn't get my go at my station where you have to get graded. And I'm walking up the hill and then it starts pouring on us. And then you just start falling over each other. And I'm like, holy crap, I'm like a week into this shit. <laughs> and then I fall on my face. I remember that I think that the seven deltas imprinted themselves, the serial number imprinted itself. on Even with my, I had my Kevlar on, it still went smack. Wow. Right in my, and, and, it's just, and it's just little things like that. That's what Ranger School, I tell guys, Ranger School isn't, a, it's, it's like little hits every day until you just want to, oh, I want to quit. And then towards the end of it, I remember Florida phase, there was one specific, and I did I actually talked about this in the Ranger way. It was our last hump back. It was about 12, 13 miles. We have one more hump where we've got to do a ruck march back and then we're done. I'm done. How much are you carrying at this point? Uh, at this point in time, actually, I, I was carrying, it was about 70 pounds and I had the 240. But we also had a sleeping bag We because I went through in the wintertime. Wintertime, it's still cold. I, I'm a winter ranger, it was miserable. Where at? Uh, this was actually in Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, Herbert, but it's, holy shit, it's colder than hell. I know I just got out of Dahlonega, so I was getting out in the snow, and, and now I'm like, oh, fuck, I get to be in Florida, and I get to be warmed up. No, it's, not, it's not warm in Florida. It was the last hump, and I'm coming back, and I remember that I started to fall behind, and I'm, I'm strong. I'm a strong ruck marcher, at least at that point in time. I don't fall back. I don't ever have problems ruck marching, and I'm falling behind everybody, and we're at six miles in. We guess I got six miles to go, and, and I can't keep up. How uh, is it? Know. Is it hilly? Yeah, yeah. no, you're going yeah. hilly, and, and my shoulders are screaming, and I, I never feel like this. And there was this one guy from IOBC that I had helped through I, I carried some extra stuff when he was falling behind. Not that you are, I know this, but I would smuggle a couple hua bars every once in a while. And I, I knew the supply started in Florida and he would kind of hook, so I, but I gave him to the squad. So I fed him a little bit. Wasn't physically strong, just could push himself. And there was a couple times where I just like, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. I, I would talk down to him because I, you know, you, you just get mad, you mm -hmm. get angry. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're hungry and you can't sleep and you don't sleep. Well, I remember he could see me falling back and I mean, come on, I'm almost done. Six miles, I'm not going to make this. And I don't fall out of ruck marches. I can do I'm, this is easy and he came up to me and he goes hey man can I take that from you 
it humbled the hell out of me because I'm like, holy crap, this guy. He been, said it to you. He came to me. Wow. It almost brought tears to my eyes. Cause I was like, holy crap, I've been giving you shit, dragging you along, telling mm. you to get your ass up, and then you're going to actually be a bigger man, and you're going to come and say, hey, can I take that from you? And he traded me. He, he took the 240. And I had the only sleeping bag that the squad had. We carried these sleeping bags just in case somebody got hypothermic. We never got to use them. We just got to, I just had to carry it. So I had it all discombobulated on my ruck. So that's why my shoulders were all screaming because I wasn't sitting right. And we got, he got a fix for me. And I made it, and I was like, oh, okay. And I took off and I was fine. That was it. But it was just one of those things where, and that really showed me, even though I, I, I passed and I got through and I was miserable and it sucked and we were freezing, you know, he showed me character. He showed me that sometimes, you know, the guy that you're thinking not gonna make it, the guy that you're giving crap to, that yes, you're helping, but really you're helping him maybe out of pity more than anything else. He's the one that's gonna come in, you know, he's gonna be able to take the onus and, and he's the one that's gonna get you through. That's and a trip. It was humbling, it was, it was amazing. I, I wish I remembered his name too. I just, I remember specifically because I really thought I was done. I thought I was like, crap, I don't have to, I've been through all this, I'm gonna have to reach And you're almost there, you're, you're wrapping it up. Yep, six miles or I'm, I'm like, oh shit, I'm gonna have to do this all over again. And he just comes out of nowhere, hey, hey man. He, and he could have, the way I acted to him, he could have said, you know, F you, dude. The, like, is the 240 the saw or what, what is That's the, the big machine gun. The old M60 is now the 240, so it's the big 7.62 belt fed. It's, it's a little heavier. Do they call it a saw or no? No, I, a saw's I, a smaller one. I, Saw's, saw's a, a 249. I used to yeah. carry the saw. It can be single person, but it's usually, uh, you have a, the, the machine gunner, then the ammo, the assistant gunner, then the ammo bearer. That's not a light weapon. No, you. no. You're carrying a pretty... No, that was, was a lot. And then because I was one of the stronger guys in the squad, honestly, I think God said, you know what, we're going to humble you. You've been an arrogant SOB getting through this thing straight through. We're going to we're gonna scare you a little bit and humble you, and we're going to say you're real. I do really think that because I... I never fall out. I was very blessed to have good leg strength, be a good runner, and, and could carry a lot of weight. And yeah, he humbled the hell out of me. Don't be that arrogant leader anymore. Well, I tell you, not a lot of people uh, would, would uh, be a ranger. Every time you saw somebody that was ranger or special forces, the level of admiration was at a whole different level. You see officers, and you have yeah. to salute them, but when you see an enlisted guy who's a ranger and he would tell the stories, we had the utmost respect for him. I remember that for that two and a half, three year period being at Fort Campbell, how it meant to us to see another person that it's, was a it's ranger. Tough. So Free, Freezing out there, not sleeping. Yeah. Oh, man, I remember. But, I, remember but I, can, I can see having a blast with you. I'm sure anybody that was at your unit with your level of sarcasm and jokes and all that, there is a level of camaraderie <laughs> in the military that till today, yeah. the amount of pranks and jokes oh, we still pulled saying. that is, if, if the world knew about the pranks that are pulled in the army, you would create the number one YouTube channel in the world with the pranks <laughs> yeah, that was the, pulled in the military. And the chubbin's just the, just the minor thing. I used to chub shit all the movie. That's right. <laughs> chubbin, guys, that's where you rub your dick on some. If you leave it out, I'm rubbing my dick on it. That's what it is. All right, I know we lost all our Christian sponsorships right there. My bad, guys. We chub, you know, when people say I, chub is, you know, we used to, we found his brain in the movie, or probably, yeah. that's right, that's what I said. I, found I his, remember guys who sleep actually, with their mouth open. That was a terrible, oh, yeah, that that's, was a, that's a those tea, pictures that's, were all over the yeah, place. Yeah, you're gonna, plastered. damn right, you're gonna get yeah, tea bagged. Just use your visualization with the, with the, the, the you know, tea bag. Tea bag was, without the tea bag. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. This message is sponsored by U.S. Army, you know. Yeah, be all be you all can that be. you can be in the be Army. Yeah, be. that's it. Army of one. <laughs> one. Who thought of that slogan? We're supposed I love to be, a, to be all that you can be. Did I just be? spit all over you? I'm no, sorry. Okay. That's right. I'm getting all motivated, getting all excited about <clears throat> chubbing a tea it's, bag. <laughs> sorry. So the chubbing doesn't go nah, away. I don't work right, does it? <laughs> This but you know what was crazy? Some guys could ha handle it. Some guys who couldn't handle it. But that's that's what was so great because again, if you can't handle those little yeah. jokes, how are you going to handle it when we're overseas together for yeah. six months to a year? How are you going to handle it if we get in combat? How I are know, you man. I, I I had a blast. Yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah. I had a flipping. <clears throat> blast with the time that I was in. It's probably one of the best memories of my life being in the military. Yeah, cool. I got one more. I got one more. We're at the beginning of range school. I remember at the beginning we're at we're at Benning phase and 70 bat boy they call us bat boys 75th guys are called bat boys when you say benning phase you're in georgia we're or in benning? georgia okay. we're at four it. We're at, so yeah. we call it benning phase yeah. it's not forest phase it's not swamp you know swamp phase is eglin mountain phase is delonica benning phase is benning so we're at Benning, and all the bat boys all the guys from the 75th ranger regiment you can't smoke us and us and, be, and we're gonna we're gonna make fun we're gonna have jokes and we're gonna laugh so that whenever we get smoked up we'd be yeah give us some more and you hear everybody that wasn't a bat boy especially the officers like from infantry officers basic they're like, shut up, they're gonna keep smoking. Like, they're gonna keep smoking us regardless. Just have fun with it, embrace it, embrace it. And you would see Bat Boys just, give us more, give us. everybody else would be crying. But also the benefit of being a Bat Boy too is also, you, 
being at battalion, you have to be pretty physically fit. You have to be able to run. You have to be doing. I mean, doing the, the minimum. What would you stand, run your two miles? What was your um, number actually, on two miles? Actually, uh, and this is this is. I ran my two miles in eleven fifteen. I could do one hundred and nineteen push-ups in two minutes and one hundred and twenty sit-ups in two minutes. Oh, so you're three hundred plus to yeah, the top. Yeah, I was very. I was. I was blessed with good genes. I was very good for you. One hundred nineteen in two minutes. Yeah, I haven't heard that, a lot about one hundred nineteen in yeah, two minutes. Yeah, I was, and I were. They were Eighty-two full. was the number for twenty-one years. Eighty-two, and like I. I, uh, I uh, think uh, my highest PT score was 387. No 387, shit. 388. You know, and you that, did that as a 27, 28 year old. Yes. That's not even. Yes. And that's, but the thing is, though, is that in the military, especially special ops, that's, that's the first thing you see. What's your PT score? And you can gauge a lot of people's character off their PT score. And then when you come in and they find out, oh my gosh, he can actually still write a complete sentence too. Then you're like, it's not, you're like, oh man, he, could, he knows how to use that. He, he knows may how not to use be military intelligence, but we can use him we for some stuff. Here, you know, yeah. It's not going to be a mind, but he'll be okay. That was fun. No, I, I just remember all the other people crying on the crying and going, oh, you guys, oh, shut up, shut up. I'd be like, stop whining, you little, stop whining, you little bitches. Just, you keep, you, they're going to smoke us anyway. Enjoy it. And, and that's why we, you know, and that's why we have fun. That's why even that night in Benghazi, I'm telling jokes. We're enjoying it. How do you, you make fun. You, it's going to bring your morale down. It's going to bring your motivation down. You're, you're a better fighter when you're loose and happy. I, I, it's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. And, and, but also, you got to be able to turn it on. But it's motivating turning it on. Not, oh, my God, I'm going to die here. This sucks. Uh, no. I, no. Keep fighting. Have fun with it. So, uh, listen. Book. The Ranger Way. We're going to put the link below. I'm sure the picture's up right now. If you go on the description section, it's going to be below. What's your, uh, uh, what's your handle on Twitter and Instagram? Actually, right? it's just my name. If you just search Chris with a K, though. Chris Paranto, P-A-R-O-N-T-O. Uh, the Twitter is, I mean, uh, Twitter is just Chris Peronto. Just search Chris Peronto, and I'm going to pop up. It's okay. at Chris Peronto. Okay, we'll yep. put the handle right here. Um, and then the Instagram is actually Chris, like I said, K-R-I-S underscore, underscore Peronto, P-A-R-O-N-T-O underscore Tonto. And then Facebook I do, but honestly, that lady over there, Judy, I don't even, guys, I don't even mess with Facebook so too much So on Facebook, anymore. his name is really Judy. It's just really so you Judy. Know, if somebody uh, messages you with no curse words, it's not him. I just it's want not, you to know. Exactly. Well, no, if, that's, if it is me, then if it's all, oh, hey, this is sweet, all hugs and kisses, yeah, that's, that's not, not me. Him. No. So, so send a tweet at Chris. Uh, uh, Peranto. Uh, uh, Chris Peranto. Again, handle will be right here. Let him know what you took away from this uh, episode. If you watch 13 uh, hours and it made an impact in your life when you were watching it and you have a certain level of respect and admiration, make sure you let him know. And if the book, if you, if you are somebody in the leadership business in that world, go pick up the book as well, The Ranger Way. There's a lot to be learned from anybody that goes through that school and a guy that makes it at the level that he made it. So with that being said, brother, thanks, brother. thanks so much oh, for going out. Yeah, I had really a had a good time. Thanks, guys. Really had a good time.